Okay. So hi, everybody. Uh, I hope you are all doing great. Uh, welcome to this uh, fish. Today, we are delighted to have uh, Hadi Achibegi from TU Delft in uh, the Netherlands. Uh, Hadi is currently associate professor at TU Delft. Uh, he holds a PhD from ETH Zurich and is postdoctoral research at Stanford Energy Resources Engineering before joining uh, TU Delft in 2013. He was also guest professor at Stuttgart University between 2017 and 2020. Um, together with uh, Sebastian Geiger from Harriet White University, Hadi is hosting a very successful uh, weekly seminar, webinar on YouTube uh, featuring uh, frontier researchers in the field of, of geoscience and geoenergy. I, I of course, uh, highly recommend the seminar series. And uh, I think they recently celebrated their, their one year anniversary a couple mm -hmm. of weeks ago. Uh, Hadi's research interests are centered around uh, modeling, simulation, and sensitivity analysis of sub subsurface processes for large-scale renewable energy storage, geoenergy exploitation, and greenhouse gas storage. Uh, today, he will talk about a multi-scale experimental and numerical study of underground, uh, underground hydrogen storage. Sorry. Please, Hadi, uh, take it away. Thank you very much, Adrian. Uh, thanks to everybody. It's my uh, true pleasure and honor to uh, share these moments with you and, and present you our uh, ongoing research and some recent findings and share with you some challenges that we are facing as well and seek for uh, mutual collaboration or discussion about this subject. The work is, is presented by me, but obviously it's not just my work. There are many, many uh, students and colleagues who have contributed in different parts, and I'm going to just uh, mention the names when the topic uh, is relevant. And uh, I hope uh, I deliver a good and useful message during this uh, hour lecture. Uh, the topic is about hydrogen storage in the subsurface formation. And I'm going through a, a kind of ongoing research, both from experimental and numerical analysis for that subject. As you know, uh, whenever we produce something, and we are gonna distribute it to clients. In between, there must be a storage plant. For any, anything uh, practically in, in a, everyday life, including also uh, energy, climate, and water resources as well. For energy, naturally renewable energy resources are intermittent. So storage there is crucially important because there are moments we don't really have enough income. For climate, Actions, uh, everybody uh, knows about uh, CO2 sequestration. Um, and so the climate driven activities for storage is that we produce more than uh, we should. So therefore we need to store it and more permanently. And therefore the, the cyclicity and the storage cycles or timeframes would be quite different here. Water resource ma uh, management as well. Uh, there are uh, artificial islands for people to live on this planet as is getting more and more uh, populated. And also natural water resources, especially in places where we have uh, scarce uh, precipitations. And then for agricultural purposes, and so uh, there is a, a crucial demand in proper storage management of our water, uh, fresh water, for example, resources. Here in this talk, I'm going to mainly focus about energy and make it relevant to subsurface and geosciences. Obviously building on a uh, past uh, decade of uh, success or uh, science you know, different uh, variety of scientific activities related to climate driven research. And to give you a perspective, we just spoke with, uh, with Lauren before the webinar started about the starting uh, classes with quizzes. It's not really an official quiz, but I just made this uh, slide uh, to actually ask about whether uh, in the audience we know how much energy do we consume in, in a country. In uh, Netherlands or in the US, obviously the scales are quite different, but do you, for example, in Netherlands, we have about 17.5 to 18 million residents. And the scale of the energy that the clients in the supply part are asking us is in the scale of terawatt hour. So in Netherlands, we are consuming in total about 800 terawatt hour. 
in the US a lot more from the resources I could find. Obviously, these numbers could be a bit higher or lower, but the scale is this. So if you want to divide, design a storage platform for them, you need to know the clients are demanding for this massive scale of energy. And that's no joke to say we develop a storage for renewable energy or for, uh, let's say, uh, other sources of energy or climate driven for CCS on other water resources as well. The scale is really huge. And if we look into how do we store energy and what options do we have? Electrical vehicles are known to be quite successful in coming nowadays more and more to our uh, daily life. The very good version of a vehicle, an electrical EV, would store about 100 kilowatt hour. So you could just have it 150 or 120, but it's this scale. So one passenger car would store about 100 kilowatt hour for about 260, 300 miles for a passenger car. To store the amount of energy that you would need for Netherlands, you need about 8 billion of these uh, material-based, uh, electricity-based uh, battery. And obviously, you're not going to store the entire year consumption, but a part of it, a good part of it, would be really massive. And obviously, it would be out of the question to go from this uh, country, Netherlands, all the way to US, it would be just beyond the scope of any of these electrical based batteries. So what else or how else we could store energy? We can use electrochemistry or other methods to convert renewable energy into different options, different forms of energy that would have different storage capacities and different discharge time. We could go to compress air, so use uh, energy to compress gas like air, or do pumped hydro, you know, inject water uphill when you need energy, have it come back downhill and rotate a turbine for you, for example. You could do heat storage, you could heat up aquifers sometimes, and these are quite relevant, especially for geothermal heat management, because you have overproduction of heat sometimes and you need to store heat in heat form because converting to work would lose a lot of factors, efficiency factors. And obviously with electrochemistry, you could convert it to hydrogen through electrolysis. A cubic meter of hydrogen in room temperature around room, 50 bars would store about one Tesla car battery energy. So you would need about 8 billion cubic meters of it if you want to store the entire consumption for one year of Netherlands, for example. Assuming that the conversion factor and returning it to heat or electricity would be perfect. Obviously, you need to account for the exergy analysis and conversion factors here too. You could now use your hydrogen and take CO2 and capture CO2 and create green methane. There you have about four times of the energy capacity, but a little bit also longer time to reclaim it because you would go to more giant reservoirs. There. Now, here again, if you convert it to gas, to green gas, especially for the purpose of this talk is about hydrogen, you need the storage facilities. Where would you store this much of a lot of billion cubic meters of green gas? There are surface-based storage tanks, facilities. There you can store, let's say, liquid hydrogen, and they are being used also, and they are not really new. So you could have liquid hydrogen there. There are facilities in Japan, for example, for a space uh, agency where you can just launch rockets there, and there you have highly secured liquid hydrogen, quite costly, at very low temperature to store a lot of energy there. Volumetric safety and efficiency and accessibility, they are really not that feasible to come to urban areas more often or scaled up to the scale of the energy that we would like to consume. What would be the alternative place to store these massive green gas? We propose, or not we, I mean, we means uh, geoscientists propose the option of subsurface storage. In the subsurface formations, you have giant spaces that you could utilize in order to store the green gas. And so you would say, 
let's just do it. If you have a space, you know where to do. We do electrolysis, store your energy, we are done. And obviously that's the concept is straightforward, but the details and, and sciences behind this is a little bit more challenging than it looks like. Let me just set the objectives here as a very uh, course of scale objective. The objective is you go down in the layers, subsurface layers, geological layers in the uh, earth. And depending on where you end up, whether you can end up in a salt rock depositions, where we used to historically do solution mine salt caverns to get salt for pharmacological aspects or, or food. There you can now use these spaces, which are like cavities of huge spaces for cyclically storing your hydrogen. Another way would be to go in other reservoirs, depleted gas reservoirs or oil reservoirs or aquifers. And cyclically, again, in this cartoon, we are showing a schematic of how it would look like possibly. So it's just only a cartoon for just showing the concept that you would cyclically store your green fuel in the subsurface formation. Objectives are in a cyclic manner, store your fluid fully inside the reservoir, maintain the purity. So make sure when you are producing hydrogen, there is no hydrogen sulfide there, otherwise your fuel cells would never work. So you have a, some sort of uh, criterion up there, or if you make it impure, then you need to spend again more cost to do purification process like filtering. And obviously one other very important factor here is operate below critical stress. In the cyclic loading zone, that's a little bit of different story than bonoton zone. And especially when you look into the reservoirs, in the geoscience applications, we know that from our past experiences that reservoirs are giant, they have heterogeneous properties, they operate in kilometers, but their physics takes place in micro scale. They could have faults or fractures within them or in vicinity, so they are quite important to, to, look, to be looked at quite precisely to avoid, let's say, induced seismicity. They are multi-scale also in terms of the data acquisition that we take and the uncertainty that we have from them. These are quite common in many applications, especially porous rock reservoirs. But when it comes to energy storage in form of gas, the cyclic transport and mechanics becomes quite relevant, which is very much specific for this specific purpose of cyclic energy storage. And also hydrogen is a new gas. Hydrogen did not exist in the subsurface. So it's not like gas storage as we know, it, uh, uh, methane storage. It's, it's a new molecule that is going to be introduced in the subsurface. So it's lifetime existence, reactivity, impurity, whatever it goes, is quite different as well. So with this setting of the objectives and the common challenges in the larger scale scope, let's just compare it with what we know about CO2 storage. In many aspects, CO2 storage and this type of hydrogen or underground energy storage share similar uh, challenges, except mostly about being monotonely injecting CO2 or less cyclic, obviously, but here we are doing cyclicity. And also, especially, we don't really care much about the purity of CO2. We'd like it to be there and trapped for a lifetime, hopefully, or otherwise we would like to inject it back, produce it back if we want to have a specific utilization for it later. But here, maintaining purity and especially geochemistry and microbiological aspect related to maintaining of purity and mixing of it with the reservoir fluids and gases uh, becomes quite important. Okay, do we have these uh, spaces available? In the North Sea neighborhood where I live, this is Netherlands, you will see that we have salt rock deposition. This is the map of salt rock deposition close to North Sea. And there is a North Hydrogen power plant to uh, be operational by 2030, which is the largest European green hydrogen production between many partners, Shell, Equinor, uh, Gas Uni is a large gas provider in, in Europe. And so they are aiming for three gigawatts of power to be used to produce hydrogen. And by 2040, it's about 10 gigawatts. Now we have salt deposition, so you can utilize it for hydrogen storage here. There is no rigorous uh, field development plan yet. 
developed. So if that will be happening also, that would help a lot the policymakers and also it would have a lot of impact in the, in the scientific community. And all the way you could go to depleted reservoirs that are more commonly found and aquifers. And this has been also studied for CO2 and Ruben is already in, in, in the audience uh, and there are uh, uh, this, this study especially also use it for my teaching as well. It's, it's a very nice uh, study that also maps the aquifers that could be potentially the, the storage location for CO2. So we do have different locations from salt caverns to depleted reservoirs and aquifers for them. But now let's make it, then every option would have different, of course, challenges uh, related to it on the keeping res uh, fluid inside the reservoir, maintaining the safety, operate below the critical stress, and also maintaining the purity. What are the challenges for this entire hydrogen storage program? Is there are hydrodynamic and geomechanics aspect to it, but just for the sake of completeness, I wanted to mention and recognize that geochemistry and microbiology is very important, but some bacterial activities in the subsurface could enhance H2S formation, and that's very important. Thermodynamics of hydrogen, and especially it's impure hydrogen in the subsurface reservoir is also something of very important, and we don't have much data about it. Policymaking, monitoring, and especially here, exergy analysis, learning that are we really doing good? Is it really making sense, or do we have market for it? And so they are all aspects that are important. I'm going to focus on these two, and especially also part of these two, to my actually today's uh, current stage of, of research. So for hydrodynamics and the geomechanics, there are two things I said at the beginning that all reservoirs shared with each other. One is about multi-scale feature. Multi-scale modeling in the subsurface reservoirs are sometimes actually looked or mainly looked like this. You have a poor scale physics where you are describing your micro scale process, whether fluid mechanics or rock mechanics or their interaction. There you assume that you have a scale separation with what comes as fine scale, continuum scale. Here you use Stokes problem as the momentum balance for your fluid or Navier-Stokes, depending on what you really need. But in here, you replace your Stokes problem to Darcy flow. So Darcy becomes your relationship between velocity and pressure gradient. That becomes your fine scale geological feature in decimeter to centimeter continuum. From here on to kilometer scale, Parameters, heterogeneous parameters that you have to describe your reservoir do not have a scale separation. So you stay within the RC regime all the way through. And so physics wouldn't really change much, but you may have significant or less significant impact of one force like capillary force or viscous force or other things. So it's very important to distinguish between these two ways. These would give us parameters, constitutive laws to the continuum scale and we mainly with multi-scale simulation mean that we go from here to here to fill. With modeling, we usually upscale pore scale to core flood or core, core scale, continuum scale. So these are just uh, um, uh, setting the uh, semantics. And about uncertainty that I mentioned, we have multi-resolution data. This is what we have in the best case practice in the field scale, kilometer scale. What we want is fine scale, continuum scale, at least, to be able to really detailly know what the reservoir would really look like. So data simulation or inverse modeling for us is more about multi-resolution data that we have. Close to wells, we have more information. Far from wells, we have less or sometimes no information. And finding some fine scale parameter would be also meaningful here. I'm going to be less on the technical aspect of this whole thing. I rather just introduce the subjects, but I would be delighted to share any uh, anything on that, especially discuss if the, any of these subjects would be of relevance or interest to any, any audience here, any person. Let me go back to CO2 storage a bit for a reason. In general, whenever we want to develop a site for any scientific application, we go to geosciences. We go from different scales and connect them dynamically to understand how the macro scale physics connects with kilometer scale through two steps, upscaling to obtain parameters, and then from there, multi-scale simulation or, or advanced computational methods and other things to really do our business well. We do from constitutive laws and model parameters, divine our static or dynamic model, and at the end in the geosystem, in the kilometer scale, 
we do inverse modeling because we observe it at that scale and optimize our operation. For CO2, the study has gone through many, many of the geoscientists have contributed in understanding how the poor scale physics can be represented into Darcy scale constitutive laws, like permeability, relative permeability, capillary pressure, uh, dissolution of CO2 into brine, and all the other factors. And the list is absolutely incomplete, but just wanted to share some of those that uh, we all know about their uh, great contribution in the field, but many, many more have done a lot of meaningful contribution. But this is just a concept look that the poor scale to continuum scale has been also done in the CO2 storage studies. And there from there, the multi-scale, multi-level simulations of how to capture heterogeneity in the coarser blocks or finer blocks and do life cycle assessments of how CO2 dynamics could take place is being done by many of the colleagues. And also we have been also contributing in this line as well. And there you can then assess how much of different the storage mechanism you could have in a heterogeneous or homogeneous or different sensitivity analysis can be done. I claim for hydrogen, we should do the same thing. But if I want to emphasize even further that why is it that I am emphasizing on this subject more is that when you go to the literature, this is not yet being done that way. I could go and take my uh, group simulator. There are plenty, dozens of them, tons of the simulators that could be used to do hydrodynamic and geomechanics of hydrogen storage. You need to define some continuum scale parameters there because the finest scale that they have is continuum scale. And there you need to do multi-scale simulation or whatever else you would like to do to enhance your computation mainly from finest scale to courses to field scale. And when we go to literature, there are studies in the literature on, on a assessment of feasibility of a storage of hydrogen uh, in the subsurface, different subsurfaces, for example, in this case, uh, aquifer, or you could do that with gas reservoirs, a steel hydrogen could be in contact, let's say, with brine. There are ad hoc functions used in the literature, obviously, just as a first uh, assessment of how much can we store, what can we do or so. And the studies that have been used are less on any any experiment basis or poor scale analysis. So some functions with no hysteresis, for example, so forward move of movement of a vetting phase to backward, advancing or receding have been not really looked as different processes. And the functions have been used as if we had, for example, air and water in a shallow subsurface formation in hydrology, for example. We found one core flood experiment where in France, they took a fully saturated sandstone brine and flooded with hydrogen and, and found relative permeability and capillary pressure curves in a steady state, and then re inversely found what would be the possible contact angle. So let's look at this because it's, it's an experiment. There is just also just out of the uh, of a, a paper about tilted surface, but it's less relevant. So I just wanted to, to mention it, but it's really not too much relevant to this storyline that I'm giving. So here they said, let's take the contact angle of when hydrogen is pushing brine out. So you have receding contact angle of brine. You would get 21 degrees of receding contact angle if you perform your study at the core flood scale, steady state as much as they could achieve. When you go to 21 degree receding contact angle in what we know as Moro's function that gives you hysteresis in advancing and receding contact angle, you end up with something close to 80 degrees of intrinsic or a static contact angle. And for 21 receding contact angle, your advancing contact angle will be more than, if you follow Moro's function, it would be more than 100 degrees. So we had to even modify the Moro's function to keep it below 90 degrees because it doesn't make sense that the vetability to hydrogen would change. If you inject hydrogen, rock likes brine, when you are producing like a rock likes hydrogen. So it cannot be more than 90 degrees. So then we said, let's just modify this. So don't go beyond 90 degree. With that, we started with uh, our uh, grad student, Leila did that work with Martin Blunt and myself. We worked on doing some poor scale sensitivity analysis to see what functions can we get by these range of the only existing then uh, study. We went to rock dynamics at the poor scale with 
quasi-static, quasi-static poor, poor network modeling. And then they found, we found that for, let's say, uh, Bentheimer or Beria sandstone, what we find is that the literature, which is the blue line here, has used this blue curve of Van Kluchten. And the best match possible that we can get is this one with our poor network modeling. Endpoints are quite different. And this is only the first drainage, the first time that you would have saturation or volumetric a percentage of water to flush and get the hydrogen out. So you would actually see that it would be that your water saturation would decrease, 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 and would come in here. And hydrogen saturation would, would actually increase. And so we could not really match. So we said, well, what we needed to do our simulation and do technical feasibility for our uh, um, funders. So then let's say, let's get this contact angle that is being reported by do sensitivity analysis. See what are the most important factors there. And obviously we found contact angle and digital rock characteristics are quite important. And then we studied cyclicity of how would the imbibition or, or advancing and receding contact angle would actually play a role on different patterns in the functions, upscale functions to be used in our reservoir scale simulator. And one interesting thing, it's an extensive study. One interesting thing here is that the amount of trapped hydrogen in each small grid block like this, in this, because this will be, for example, one grid block representative of that, would depend on rock characteristics and contact angle, but the trapped amount of hydrogen in your small block in the reservoir would not be dependent on the cycles. So if you repeat one cycle or two cycles or 10 cycles, you would get the same amount of trapped hydrogen in that thing. So contact angle and rock properties found to be the most important thing. Rock property is something you do digital rock imaging, but how about contact angle? So I can use this study and do my, the rest of the study, but a chain is no stronger than its weakest link. What, what parameters should I use in my simulator to actually do this technical study? So we started to develop our own experimental facility in there to do hydrogen, hydrodynamics. With geomechanics, we mostly collaborate and there are other colleagues in the, in the same lab who do uh, geomechanics of cyclic loading, but uh, I mainly are, am involved with the experiments for the hydrodynamics part. And we said it's important to go across the scales to characterize the hydrogen transport mechanism because one scale may not be really complete. So we started with bubble rise. I'm gonna explain about that. At this moment, we are busy with microfluidics. And we hope in near future, go to macro city and city. And again, also do the core flop as is one done in the literature and see, is there any other findings that we can, we can contribute? What does this bubble cell mean? We have an oven here. We have our, uh, uh, there is a kind of a cylinder inside this, this chamber, this cell as we call. And here, as you see, the bubbles of hydrogen are being uh, released from nozzle. And this goes to the line of hydrogen here. And we have nitrogen for back pressure. So we, we release drops of bubbles of hydrogen. And then here we take photo. There's a camera here adjusted. So it took a bit of time to adjust everything. And then we can actually uh, uh, maintain the temperature as we want and pressure as well. So what do we do is that we take the bubbles, we measure the properties and find the contact angle by fitting. And we did the fitting curves uh, and all by hand ourselves, we developed a code to do image processing. And for nitrogen, brine contact, we could match precisely the literature. And it was comforting for us that now we can move on to hydrogen. And here we went through different rock phases, brine phases, different temperature and pressures, and we did the the study of releasing of hydrogen bubbles and look at them through the life cycle because it would diffuse and dissolve into the brine and would disappear and, and measure the contact angle. Our finding was hydrogen intrinsic contact angle was around this 30, 35 and very much different than intrinsic contact angle of about 80 that Corflot was giving. And this is the first time I have seen the droplet of hydrogen being plotted and taken photo of, no study I have seen has actually 
uh, plotted or take, took any image of this, this uh, contact of brine with hydrogen at different salinities, rock types, and so this is what we are seeing. So Moreau's function were actually correct. We could just use it with no modification needed. And so we did that and did the cyclic study of what would be the real, you know, relevant contact angle. And so for that, what would be the relevant functions to use in the uh, uh, continuous scale simulations? Right now, we are busy with dynamic contact angle measurements, as I said, and there is a lot to be done in this part. And we would be delighted to see collaboration or discussion on that subject. Next would be obviously to characterize dispersion diffusion. It's not as easy as this one. And so we are not yet doing it, but we, will, we, will, we have a plan for doing that. From that now to rock mechanics and how do we do multi-scale and I'll finish my talk. Rock, so that was the fluid dynamics, hydrodynamics. You do cycling and then you do what you can and then get the curves of relative permeability, capillary pressure and dispersion diffusion and other things that you need to do in order to feed it to your simulator and the simulator does no better than input data. So what about rock mechanics? And for that, you need cyclic loading because you are doing cyclic loading in your storage. And with cyclic loading, life is a little bit less of elastic. You go to nonlinear mechanics because cyclicity would encourage that uh, phenomenon to happen. We actually looked into understanding this subject Started with it, you know, when you have total strain, is no more just elastic part, but you have creep, is the time dependent deformation, thermoplasticity, and viscoplasticity. But we know from Hooke's law that strain elastic is proportional to stress. So if we subtract total stress from the rest, the red part, you can actually write epsilon elastic based on total displacement, total strain, and the rest. And this is exactly what. Uh, coefficient of elasticity would look like with the strain grad symmetric displacement and this kind of nonlinear terms, which are representative of your nonlinearities. And here we said, let's go and do modeling to understand how do we put the term creep from the experiments that have been done? What to do with viscoplasticity? What to do with thermoplasticity? With creep, we found different models, obviously, and we implemented all of them in, from scratch in our, in our codes to understand what type of creep, which means displacement would go through a material under some sort of time dependent process. And we do that only from these stages. We don't go to rupture or failure. We just add these functions, which would make our strain here, mathematically speaking, dependent on a stress field and time and some constitutive parameters. And so it would make it nonlinear. So makes it a little bit more challenging to solve mathematically. For viscoplasticity, we have found a lot of useful information here. And we are finishing our work, not yet fully done with the viscoplasticity. We are done with the creep part. And so for the creep, we went to these functions and found what experiments we can find and tune our parameters so that we can say these A and M is coming from an experiment of triaxial loading for cyclic uh, loading of the material for creep. And what we could do is that we could match the first cycle. More cycles, our, our fitting parameters could never match this. So even if you have cyclic loading things, uh, we could match the first, but uh, away from it, it's not. And then that's also another challenge for us that if you wanna do hundred years of a storage, then how do you do this hundred years of cyclicity and find the right formula? Is it the formula not too flexible or, or we should do different uh, way of characterizing or, or understanding the nonlinear plasticity here in this equation. And so for that, we went to fit those now A and M, M that we found and solved it for cyclic load of this rock salt and to the, let's say this is an Italian field quite known from the group of Professor Tiatini. We got this and then said, what would be the uh, reservoir, deep, yeah, I'm sorry, the surface depletion, I'm sorry, uh, the subsidence due to depletion of this reservoir? How would this deform? It's just a linear, a nonlinear mechanics. As time zero is here, time zero means no creep because creep is a time dependent process. And then as you have progress 10 years, you would see that in 10 years, you would see more deformation in the system because it has creep. And so we learned some lessons that I just already said, and we could partially fit experiments and we got the things that were fitting in those small experiments and used it for field scale analysis. Okay. Now, viscoplasticity is something that we, are, we have developed it as well to add to the uh, complexity here. 
but we are also right now benchmarking what we receive from our codes and, and work. And uh, we are not yet there. We have benchmarked with some studies, but not all. And, and especially uh, Ehsan and Ruben's group actually deserve a big acknowledgement from us for their uh, gracious um, cooperation and help for us to understand uh, this process and benchmark our study. If we had benchmarked it, I would have shown it to you since we are not sure about, about our benchmarking, I, I'd rather post it for another event. But uh, Ehsan especially uh, deserves a thank as well uh, for that, that uh, we are discussing with him to see uh, how could we match our results with their results. And what we follow is uh, uh, modify cam clay as they do as well. So with that, from pore to core, if you understand that fluid mechanics has hydro, you know, hysteresis, rock mechanics has nonlinear mechanics. Now I can say, I can define my system. Let's go how to do fine to field. And that's the last stage of my talk. From fine to field, we don't have separation of a scale for our parameters like K or C, as this is the elasticity coefficient or this is the permeability. In very simplistic view, we have a, a coupled process. We have something like in the most simple case, incompressible flow where I have divergence of flux in omega one with some interaction with another field like a fracture is there or well is there is equal source terms. So it's interaction with omega two. Linear balance says divergence of the stresses in poro bio theory, bio coefficient and pore pressure is source body forces. Transport is time dependent, you know, time derivative of the conserved quantity in omega one. And there might be some exchange of flux between omega two, and then you have source terms. And this is the divergence of the fluxes for omega. Different unknowns have different meanings. Some are global, like pressure, like displacement in linear sense. Some are local, like this side. It's a local transport. It has a speed of wave and it is locally changing. So if you do multi-scaling for them, it should be different. For the global ones, it's very similar to finite element analysis. You actually impose your aggressive coarse mesh, select some samples nodes here and say, I need some functions, basis functions for them. I actually locally compute them. This comes from the work of Tom Howe and, and Effendi and others, Patrick and others. But now you can use it for other sense of multi-level and for more than just pressure, you can do it for displacement and other things. You can, in any level, you can compute your locally. If this node is, for example, one, zero, 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 everything else, what would be the distribution of my global, let's say, pressure in that local set? Obviously, subject to local boundary condition. And you can match, let's say, pressure with much fewer degrees of freedom if you do that. If you only look into global multi scale simulation, you would be just finished. But how about transport, which is local? For that, we have adaptive mesh refinement strategies. There you have a speed of wave propagation where you can refine your mesh and use coarse elements far from your front. But if you have heterogeneous properties and you need to get a coarse block here and you average your heterogeneous properties, your pressure, which is a global unknown or displacement, which is a global unknown will be hurt everywhere. It's a global content problem. And so it would impact the quality of capturing your front too, even though transport per se focusedly is just local. So if you match this with the basis spaces that you locally compute the basis for your global unknowns and you put them all into an algebraic framework, you actually can now do a lot more than just doing one multi-scale thing or only AMR mesh refinement. This allows to capture global components the other one allows to capture with high resolution front and low resolution far from the front. And you can do that with restriction prolongation operator as in multi-grid terminology. And so you allow yourself to do a lot of black box integration of the entire coupled full implicit system. Results, and I'm done. This is for multi-phase flow and heat transfer in heterogeneous fractured reservoirs. This is exactly what that multi-level basis would do and so you are capturing with local basis functions, your pressure and conductive heat uh, and saturation is local and heat front as well, the convective one. So you would see that you will get front tracking methods to actually capture your results. Ingredients are just, as I said, and especially since you allow fully coupled system, you can capture compositional capillary gravity. These are the things that you need for hydrogen. 
when the pore scale analysis are finished. So this is a parallel work to just make it ready until this, this work is done and is connected to that. And if you do mechanics, you have faults or fractures in here. We do multi-scale for extended finite elements. It's heterogeneity of the elasticity coefficient with a crack in here, and you are having tensile forces in here. And these are the multi-scale solution. Multi-scale means simulation multi-scale. It's like multi-grid with aggressive coarsening. And where you do the basis functions is that basis functions are based on enrichment of extended finite elements, but the rest is gathered in finite elements. So your local shape functions become extended or enriched, but the global system becomes coarse scale, becomes just Galerkin. And we found that it's already good enough for many applications. In some others, you would actually need to iterate and smooth and iterate it like multi-grid would do. Now to the last one, which is cyclic loading, which is nonlinear mechanics. For this triaxial system, taking those coarse blocks and the basis functions, actually resulted in very good match between finite scale and multi-scale for cyclic loading and understanding of this is a stress is cyclic. So you would see the displacement here. And when you do the multi-scale and finite scale match for the subsidence time zero or through 10 years of analysis, you would see that when creep is not there, so time is zero, you match with your multi-scale local shape functions very well. But when you have nonlinear creep, and hopefully in future soon, we will also study viscoplasticity, you would see that you would deviate more because it's more nonlinear. So this kind of a space of locally computed basis functions are not enough. You could iterate and smooth and iterate on it to make it better, but this is just original multi-scale solution of this type. And to conclude, subsurface reservoirs are giant batteries. We need to store it inside below critical stress and maintain the purity. The transport cyclicity means it's hysteretic and nonlinear for both fluid and rock, which are interacting with each other. Not many experimental studies exist for hydrogen in the subsurface in situ situation. So we did some poor scale analysis and we found contact angles with bubble cell method, which are quite different than the core scale reported stuff. And in parallel, we are working on our simulate, open source simulator to develop the nonlinear mechanics and hysteresis and other things to our multi-scale framework so we can understand and connect the two at the end of the day. And some lessons we learned is that many ad hoc functions have been used in this literature. Our results are very different, I said that. And we have used for dynamic contact angle morose function. And now we need to really have more studies on dynamic ones in the porous media context. Cyclic mat matching of the nonlinear mechanics could be done for the early stages of cyclicity, but the existing parameters that we had, existing laws that we have did not allow us to match for more uh, studies, or we are missing something. I would be delighted to learn more about this subject. We have not yet studied failure analysis into creep, so we haven't gone to third stage and others. And the multi-scale uh, method that have been developed by many colleagues and including us on, uh, on capturing the fine scale heterogeneity with mesh refinement and adaptive dynamicness is, is seeming to work fine to allow us to go from fine continuum to field continuum, but all subject to the weakest link in this entire chain, which is the right constitutive laws and the parameters from the lab. So with that, I hope that you uh, enjoy the talk and uh, could engage with the questions about this subject. So I'd be delighted to take questions. Thank you very much, Hadi, for the great, great talk. Um, if anyone has a question, just feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask the question. So Hadi, this is Ruben. Um, sure. so first of all, yeah, thank you for the really Terrific talk. I, I, I think I, I learned a lot. Well, and, I, and I have uh, a question that I would pose as follows. In, so you've been thinking about you know, hydrogen uh, in the subsurface, and, and I haven't. And you also pointed to potential analogs like um, you know, methane and CO2 as starting points to develop you know, some knowledge about hydrogen storage and, and the behavior of hydrogen in the subsurface. So my question to you is sort of broad. If I were to make a table you know, with um, CO2, methane, and hydrogen as columns, 
and then as it relates to the fate of these gases in the subsurface in the pore space. Mm -hmm. uh, say wettability, mobility, um, dissolution, dissolution, and reactivity. So now those are the four rows, say. Mm -hmm. In your, uh, from, from what you already know, in, where would you say uh, one can make a strongest argument for uh, hydrogen behaving very differently from the other two gases and, 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 and making the claim, well, we really need to study more specifically about hydrogen because what we know about CO2 and, and methane just doesn't, doesn't apply or doesn't extend. Um, that's a great that's, question. That's yeah. a key Just, question, uh, but um, I'm asking it anyway. <laughs> yeah, but this, this is a great question, by the way. I, I, I give my understanding, but uh, please feel free to correct me as well. So uh, I think to, towards the hydrogen, it's, it's a specific uh, feature as if, uh, uh, since it's very tiny and very mobile compared to methane or nitrogen as they are heavier or CO2, especially in supercritical stage is about half dense of the brine around. So it's hydrogen remains gas, not supercritical, and it's really mobile gas that goes under the ground. So this is very different than others. So it can go places you would never expect CO2 would go because it's just, it can penetrate any rock, any filter. So the main question is about whether it would stay below the cap rock. So that's why dispersion diffusion experiments with saturated cap rock would be really insightful to see whether it would stay. One other thing is more about uh, applicability than really the physics part is that it's very expensive today to create hydrogen, especially green hydrogen. So this is really kind of visionary type of, you know, at this moment, if you sell it, maybe nobody would buy it this way. It's, it's expensive. The reality is uh, the market is uh, aiming to make it more affordable $1.5 and so or $2 per kilogram, it, we are not there yet. So in that case, if you lose purity and you cannot claim it back, that's really something that worries investors, especially energy companies. So for them, mixing is very important. It's important. It may not be different than mixing with, let's say, other gases, but it's very important and sensitive. And the second part is that is, is the microbial or geochemistry and microbial activities there that still your, your hydrogen is there, but because we can in the depleted gas reservoirs also with the temperature of about 50 to 100, we could have bacterial activities. And we have done a study for a Swedish company, Vattenfall. They wanted to turn a salt cavern used for natural gas to hydrogen. And our conclusion was mainly the uh, H2S, hydrogen sulfide creation, is really a, a, a threat to your business because you have half a million cubic meter of hydrogen stored in a tank. If you leave it for two years, you give a lot of time to many reactions to take place. So purity of it is more sensitive. I'm not saying it's very different than let's say if you were, would have injected CO2, but it's very sensitive because we have hydrogen. So these two aspects that it can penetrate any, anything almost except salt layer rock, and the cap rock, uh, I have talked to some uh, companies in Austria who are actually right now developing a ga um, gas reservoir to store about 2 million cubic meter of green hydrogen. And their main questions, one of them was, would it stay inside the reservoir and wouldn't penetrate outside? That's one of the very main and obviously purity. Uh, for that purity, for example, if I remember correctly, uh, the cushion gas was because you need to put cushion gas to increase the pressure of the reservoir and then inject and produce hydrogen. There are many options for cushion gas. Many times we do nitrogen, but then when you do hydrogen, you need to really have diffusion and mixing characterized. And that's something there is no data in the literature about in-situ porous rock mixing of the two. And sometimes some people think about what if we do CO2? So we use CO2 as cushion gas. So we store CO2, we inject hydrogen. So then you have utilized CO2 and as well as also stored hydrogen. And others are thinking of just use hydrogen as the, as the cushion gas because of avoiding mixing and dilution. 
So I think in that company, I think they were also thinking more about using hydrogen as cushion gas even, even though they would lose a lot of some part of it, but it would be more meaningful for them. Um, there is one other thing I did not discuss, and it's about using subsurface formation as methanogenesis, as, as the reactor to create methane, inject hydrogen and CO2 and, and let it react and create methane as well. That's also another field of geochemistry to even study. So I would say these two things, mainly at the end of the day, purity of hydrogen is extremely important, especially from geochemistry side, and, and, and also making sure that it stays below the cap rock because it can penetrate a lot of media because of being very tiny. Hi, Hadi. This is um, Darek Malabragra from uh, the MIT Energy oh, Initiative. So sure. I'll, I will preface my comment by saying that I'm not a geoscientist. I'm coming from the energy system side of uh, thinking uh, about this problem. And, you know, I've kind of landed on thinking about geological hydrogen storage primarily from the, the low energy capital cost hydrogen sort of highlighted at the very beginning. Um, and so one question I had for you, you know, uh, was around sort of, you know, there are commercially deployed facilities today, right? There are about five facilities, if I remember correctly, for hydrogen storage, for hydrogen that are doing, storage. Uh, in salt caverns. I think that about right. three in Texas and two in England. One, uh, actually, one in Teesside. In one England. in Teesside, yep. It has been uh, operational since 1971 or two. Yep. yep. And three three giant ones in Texas. Yes. So I'm just wondering, so so do, do those um, sort of geological environments um, face the same challenges that that you highlighted here with respect to porous rock or are they unique in some ways and perhaps therefore the the very first sort of resources to be exploited from a supply curve standpoint? Well, that's, a, that's an excellent question by the way, so if you wouldn't start with being not being geoscientist, I wouldn't really guess. This is really excellent. The reality is that there are four salt caverns for hydrogen there are some other uh, also porous rock uh, storage for, for hydrogen as well. There was 20% hydrogen, 80% methane in Austria, 2017 or so used. And now the same company is operating 100% hydrogen in Austria as well. And, and I am also quite active in International Energy Agency for hydrogen uh, storage as well. So that's why I get this information from uh, colleagues who do operation pilot tests and also science research as well. Um, the reality is that those four sites that you mentioned and very accurately and nicely, and one in Teesside, Britain, and three in Texas, there is not much data out there about them. That's one. Second is that they were developed and used for a long time for hydrogen. Many of the caverns we have today are thinking whether we can convert them to hydrogen is that they have been used for natural gas or diesel. Now tomorrow we want to do hydrogen if economy turns to hydrogen and hydrogen becomes valuable. The challenge of turning an existing mature cavern or reservoir to make it a hydrogen-based storage is different than creating a subsurface formation like a, a salt cavern or utilizing for the first time for hydrogen. So there are potential, especially as I was responding to the nice question Ruben was, or comment he, he mentioned, is that one major challenge here is that uh, the purity of hydrogen and especially microbial activities, whether you would dilute it because of reactivities and so. There are also methods have been used if you add fair iron, um, elements in the brine in the cavern, you would reduce significantly the bacterial reactivity. So in a way you could be, you know, you could do all the intelligent uh, chemistry and geoscience applications to do like uh, antibiotics for bacteria, right? But in more uh, cost efficient manner. There are not many uh, uh, data resources out there about those existing uh, uh, hydrogen storage sites. They are very commercial and, and secured and they are not being used mostly for cyclic storage. So they are not that, we, what we are thinking here is about uh, maybe in a monthly base, even less, few weeks, we, uh, we feel and, and unfeel. So it's a cycle in very rapid. For salt caverns, it's very rapid. For porous rocks, it's long, some months, because they are just giant monsters, right? You can just uh, uh, unload them quickly because you would cause a lot of dynamics in the seismicity, perhaps, and also stability problem. Caverns are more, more, uh, uh, flexible for high uh, frequencies of a storage and claim. So then you would like to have not one or two, like one in Teesside, three in Texas, you want to have some hundred in the north of Netherlands and Britain and Germany. 
So with that salt cavern thing, the report that the government is looking at is about some hundred of them to be, to be developed. And then you have multi-cavern system that cyclicity in one would affect the other one as well. So mechanics is quite global and connected with each other. Okay. And I think those can be manageable. Some aspects here for caverns would be more about bacterial activities, I would say. But of course, the creep and nonlinear mechanics and, and to my understanding, now Ruben is here and can correct me, uh, there are not many cyclic loading experiments for even salt rocks that are even go be, be, before porous rocks utilization in the subsidy. I mean, oil industry happened after salt uh, industry, but in, in my knowledge, uh, there is uh, kind of no useful data that would give you the cyclic loading of rock salts and porous rocks for, this, for the frequencies that this type of utilization would need. We have in hours of cyclic loading in experimental facilities for two and a half centimeter cubes. You know, uh, there, there, there is a lot to be developed. And I think that there would be a lot more of this, this channel of research to be, you know, uh, resulted in papers and so in, in the coming few years. Thank you. Of course, well, thanks for your question. Uh, in, the, in the continuity of, of your answer, um, I, I was just wondering, um, the physics in a salt cavern and uh, depleted gas reservoir is, is very different. And what, what are the other key differences between the two, like as a comparison uh, in yeah, the temperature, uh, pressure, uh, great question. Sca uh, sc scale as well? Sure, a, a scale is different. I mean, uh, but depends on how you would like to utilize. There are small gas uh, uh, reservoirs. They are big gas reservoirs we have in this north of the country. Uh, Groningen, or in Dutch pronunciation, Groningen gas field, which is quite giant, so it's huge. But uh, there are other smaller gas fields as well. But in general, salt caverns are about one cube, million cubic meters. But you have you have different ranges for them. In Texas, they are really big. Uh, construction of them also it's based on solution mining. So you would have uh, fresh water coming, and then brine goes out. Then they get the uh, salt. They fabric. They do it for pharmacological and other petro, you know, the chemical industry has a lot of uh, uh, need for salt. Uh, and then you have a, a cavity, which looks like, let me, I, I have, oh, um, I didn't actually show the most important slide, which is thanking all the young talents and some also colleagues who actually correct me when I do mistake. So I'm glad that at least I could by accident press here and, and acknowledge them all. And I have two also open position for postdocs in the case you wanted to discover the green lands of Netherlands, a bit rainy here, but yeah, you're most welcome. Uh, this is a salt cavern, Adrian. And this is the sump, which is a lot of uh, uh, hail. Uh, you could have anhydrides there. And then in here, it's a salt, rock salt. And this is the brine. And then here you would store hydrogen. Now there are bacterial uh, sulfate reducing bacteria that could uh, facilitate creation of hydrogen uh, sulfate. They could, not that they will, but they could. So you could really do some sort of geochemistry to understand how this would increase. So this is a kind of how the rock salt really look like. For compared to uh, aquifers or porous rocks, they are smaller and they are, as you see, it's not really porous, it's a cavity, it's a cave. So, and the solid uh, salt in here are really kind of a barrier for hydrogen. So it's quite safely trapped there, unless you really mess up with the mechanics and, and uh, deconstruct it and just uh, stability, just, it just collapses, for example, because it's like a tower. If you want to have a feeling that the vertical uh, dimension could be as big as Eiffel Tower. So it could be some hundred meters. Okay, it's, it's a giant thing. And then you have, you could then study that you have gas, you have liquid and you have sump here, and you can do some sort of geochemistry to understand how hydrogen sulfate could potentially be produced. And uh, with higher pH, for example, you could reduce that hydrogen sulfate concentration too. But compared to porous rocks, porous rocks are more giant. Aquifers are the best in terms of capacity as also uh, Rubens Group have studied that for CO2 as well. They provide really giant capacity for CO2. Uh, they have other challenges for hydrogen because you need Cushing gas and you need a lot of Cushing gas to flush the brine out of the way and then have hydrogen coming in cyclic as well. Um, there are many, I mean, uh, you know, the transport of hydrogen in the porous rock therefore exists for rocks 
for aquifers and depleted gas and oil reservoirs. Here, there is no really porous media flow, unless this sump can be assumed, like porous is really kind of moths and everything there. But it's really hydrogen is in, the, in this tank. Uh, so it's really a kind of tank view. And then mechanics, and then also well stability that hydrogen may, may escape here. It, it escapes faster, as I was answering to, to Ruben's a good question. It would escape faster uh, than methane, for example. We have a lot of challenges about abandoning a field with methane uh, fields, and Mark Celia has studied them as well as others, like Majid. But, uh, but here, if you have hydrogen and then you want to abandon, then the, the, or, or you want to make sure it does not really escape out, that's also quite challenging here too, especially if you have heterogeneity and then you do a lot of cyclic loading to make sure that micro cracks are not developed. And that's why I mentioned here that we have not studied the failure analysis, mainly is about would the micro cracks takes place and, and hydrogen would escape from this cavity. And regarding uh, cyclic loading and micro cracks, do you uh, have some kind of self-healing uh, behavior of the wall of the cavern? I don't know. Yeah, I, I, yes. I, mm -hmm. you, you could. I mean, the, the self-healing for, uh, I, well, in presence of hydrogen, for salt caverns, it's different. It's just like a gas that would, it would not really change it. Like if it was, not, uh, you know, methane or hydrogen, I wouldn't think that hydrogen would uh, change a lot if it was just gas storage. For porous rocks, especially sandstone, when you have clays, I think a, a, a introduction of hydrogen into clays might also cause a little bit more uh, of cracks because it might cause a bit of more uh, brittle behavior in the clay. These are the things, my speculations, and if uh, others are more knowledgeable about this subject could comment. But these are the things that, that the main important thing that I have uh, found uh, after start of this project about a year and a half ago is that there are not many data about hydrogen in the reservoir available. So that's why we are just doing uh, in our capacity to develop a hydrogen lab and we have done that and we are doing studies and we are doing more uh, microfluidics and microcity and so soon to be done as well. But these are, as you said, Adrian, these sort of things, self-healing in presence of hydrogen and so it's very geochemist based and micro structure based as well. How would the clay, for example, minerals behave if hydrogen is being penetrated through a micro crack and reaches them would be also important to study. Thank you very much. Um, any other question? We are already running a few minutes over the hour, but maybe you can take one more question if there is. If not, I, I thank you very much for the great presentation. My pleasure. Thank you very much for the invitation.